go. And we should be live any second. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Alex Chisnell here from the Festival of Startups. I'd like to welcome you to day five um, at the Festival of Startups. And this is our second session of the day. I'm joined by uh, Louis Barnett. Louis, how are you doing today, sir? Yeah, very good. Yeah, very miserable day today. So I'm happy to be inside for once. <laughs> and also joined by Tara Lalvani. Good afternoon to you, Tara. Hi, hi, how are you? I'm oh, very good, thank you. Um, and remind me, uh, whereabouts are you both um, in the UK? Um, I'm assuming you're both in the UK because I've done a couple of these this week and people have then turned out to be in foreign countries. So, um, Tara, whereabouts are you? I'm in the countryside, not far from Marlow. Lovely. Louis? Uh, West Midlands, Shropshire border. Nice, okay, and I'm down in Port in Dorset. Uh, the seaside, which is great. Um, Yasmin, thank you for joining us. Just, has this started? Yes, we have started. So apologies for being late. We are hoping to be joined by um, Claire Warner from Acorn Drinks as well. Um, or have been liaising with all week, so we're hoping she can jump on at some point um, during this session, but I didn't want to delay this any longer, so uh, we've started. So look, thank you for joining us. If you, if you haven't caught up this week, um, this is the end of week one. We've got another whole week uh, to come uh, next week for you. But you can go to the Festival of Enterprise YouTube channel and you can catch up on all the conversations I've had with the likes of Lush founder uh, Rowena Bird, um, Gray CEO Anthony Fletcher, um, Piers Linney from Dragon's Den, who I spoke to yesterday, uh, and lots more guests as well. And this session will go live straight away after we've finished on the replay as well. So um, look, thank you all for joining us. A um, Couple of ways you can interact, as you can see Bernadette and Yasmin already have. So the live chat function, uh, look, we'd normally be at a live event with real humans face to face. So use this opportunity to uh, connect, pop in, pop in your LinkedIn profile if you'd like to connect with people on here. Uh, comment on what we're talking about, um, ask a question, just below that on the right hand side, you will see the questions tab where you can ask questions um, that I can ask uh, Louis and Tara as well. And then you've also got a little down the bottom of your screen, you've got an emoji button reactions. So feel free. I've just seen a few flying up there um, already. There we go. There's a whole bunch of them flying up there as well. I can see them. Thank you very much. So look, we're hoping Claire can join us. But in the meantime, um, I've got Tara Lalvani, who's the founder and CEO of Beauty Effect. I've got Louis, who's the founder of Chocolate and now a highly regarded consultant and speaker. And the latest guest on my podcast, Screw It, Just Do It, talking all about his chocolate box methodology. So just to start with, um, and this is going to relate to what we're talking about, um, Louis, you just give us a brief synopsis on what your chocolate box methodology is uh, just a couple of sentences maybe just to, to tell people out there and i think this is going to be really relevant when we um, hopefully have a look at tara's uh, new product there for her business as well that she can she can show us yeah so um thank you for that alex great great to be on this morning so the chocolate box methodology was something that i developed over many many years i started a business on my parents kitchen table at age 12 and eight years later we're exporting 17 countries i was very lucky very early on to collect a lot of mentors in the sort of marketing and branding world and so i built the chocolate box methodology which is is all to do with five sensory branding and getting that emotional connection much deeper uh, and much faster to a consumer so that's really what what I do now. I help other businesses, um, you know, build growth and, and sustainability in in their branding and marketing. Perfect, um, Tara. T tell us um, a little bit about Beauty Effect and yourself. How long ago um, did you launch your your, your brand new brand? Um, how many products have you got? Tell us a little bit about the background. Because I've been following you on your on your Instagram account, and you've got your personal Instagram, and you've also got the Beauty Effect one on there as well. Yeah. That's right. So actually Beauty Effect is something where the idea was born actually about three and a half years ago when I wasn't looking for a business, I was actually looking for a product and couldn't believe that for some strange reason it didn't exist and decided right there and then that I had to be the one to, to make it exist. And it's been three and a half years and we were delayed obviously a little bit because of COVID as well, but it really took the time to make this product as as it is right now and it was a lot of attention to detail that went into it but it solves a really um, great you know, problem that a lot of women encounter day to day 
with the way that they have to do their makeup and have to be tied down. So this allows you to get ready in half the time, look twice as good with very little effort. So it's a, it's a win-win all around. And you say that you've, you, you had to delay the launch. Did you, did you get to the point where, you, you, you know, and, and again, nobody knew that we we're going to go into a second lockdown. Nobody knew how long the first lockdown was going to be, of course. Um, so did you look at like, the end of 2020 coming up and just thinking, I want to get this out there. Christmas is coming. A new year is coming. When am I ever going to launch this? That's exactly, I mean, screw it, just do it, do it. That's exactly what I had. I mean, um, I was planning to launch around March and then decided to put things on hold. Um, and then when I just saw no end coming to this, I thought it needs to be out there. And it's something which was ready to go, you know, working up for so long and keeping it so quiet for all that time. I was just kind of bursting to get it out there. And uh, we've only been, we only launched just under two months ago, but it's had an amazing response already. Um, seeing people using it has been incredible and benefiting from it day to day. It's just it's an incredible thing for someone who's had an idea in my mind and just from a concept to seeing a physical product and now being shipped to different parts of the world. It's it's incredible. Oh, and, and is, is it, as you say, so people can get hold of that yeah. anywhere, the, straight, mm -hmm. straight from day one, you made that decision Not that actually... Day one, but actually quite early on. So uh, oh. day one, we just did the UK. And then the demand started coming from just different places. I think the feedback I've had is no one's seen anything like this. And there wasn't something like this because if there was, I would have ordered it and saved yeah. them half years and, and a huge amount of money and time. Um, <laughs> but actually, um, yeah, there's nothing like this. So the demand has come in and we thought, okay, why not? It's, it's a little bit earlier than I was planning to start opening up international shipping, but mm. uh, we had to just do it. And and what kind of model have you, you got with then? Is it... Uh, is it uh, people buying it from your website predominantly or, or from distributors? So it was important for me to do direct to consumer to start with yeah. because I really want to understand who my customer is. Um, I think for any business, you go into it thinking that you know who's going to be buying it. But really, when you don't have, um, you know, you haven't actually launched, you don't really know who's going to be your customer. Mm. So the beauty of doing a, a direct to consumer is you can actually really understand who's your customer, who's buying, and you know how to actually target them and reach them. So that was important to me. But as we expand, retail touch point would definitely be something that I'd be considering. Yeah. Um, Lou, you, you must have seen that as well with a number of the brands that you work with throughout this year that um, people have brought forward launches, people have pushed back launches. Have, have you seen that kind of thing happening? And have, and have you seen literally like the end of the year kind of rearing its head and people going, do you know what, if I'm ever gonna pull the trigger, yeah, I think I think it's it's been a really interesting mixture between different people. I I think one of the things that it's obviously brought to the forefront is when people have got weakness in their chain when it comes to digital, and a lot of businesses did, you know, across the board, you know, in in multiple different sectors. I think that obviously none of us could have ever predicted that something like this would happen, but you know, I, I've got a lot of close friends in businesses who are really highly digitally enabled, both in sort of marketing, but their own management structure as well. You know, they're using slack and task management systems and lots of other things to drive their business forward so they've adapted really well and yet other businesses haven't they've just sort of battened down the hatches and um you know stuck their head in the sands and hoped that it would go away at some point so I, I think it's been interesting i do think that i do think things have picked up a little bit now towards the end of the year like you say people are starting to realize that this has sort of become a bit more of our reality and we just have to find a way around it. And mm. we have to be creative in, in what we're doing. And, you know, everyone needs to be digital in some way, shape or form. Yeah. Um, and interested to know, uh, Tara, with you, then, what, what have you found that some of the biggest frustrations, pain points? Because um, you've had this vision for, for so many years and you, you probably visualized how it was going, going to turn out. From uh, a product point of view, how happy were you with with what uh, you've you've launched with, and how how much in your own mind are you thinking? I also want to then add this, 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 and this for like iteration two or iteration three. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's been frustrating just holding it back for so long. Definitely, I was so excited to get it out there, and. Uh, you know, one frustration is that I haven't been able to do a physical event where I can have products lined up and people can come and come and touch and feel and see the product, you know, at work. Because really when you see it, um, just, just explaining it doesn't really do it justice. Yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons why I didn't want to tell anyone before I'd launched. 
because I'd much rather just show them the product and they can see it and understand the beauty of it. Um, so that's been a huge frustration that because of COVID, we're not able to do physical, actual launch events and even meetings with journalists or influencers, no no face-to-face, -face, you can't be with anyone. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely been a restricting factor. Um, and Louis, um, for you, when you, what's the best defini definition of a brand um, that, you, that you've heard? Because I've heard many, many, many over, over the years and seen different presentations and attended events when people have tried to break it down. Um, given your experience in working with such a, a wide variety of brands, um, what's one of your favorite ones that you've, 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 you've come across? So I, I think brand is the personality of an organization. And, and you know, what you're really saying with that is it's, it's all about subconscious and it's all about limbic brain. And I think as soon as you start to put yourself in, in that perspective as a business, you can start to really figure out what brand is and what it's not. And so the problem is that, you know, marketing inevitably actually a lot of the time is very data driven. It's very logical. It's very numbers based. You know, brand is a lot more subjective. It's it's more art than science in many ways. It doesn't mean that there isn't data and research out there. You know, color psychology is an example. There's a huge amount of data and research out there on what colors you use and your brand affect the subconscious. But I think you have to liken it to meeting another person. You know, sometimes we just, we meet somebody, we like them, we get on. When we meet our partners, girlfriends, husbands, wives, best friends, we make a lot of uh, assumptions as humans, you know, within the first couple of seconds. And people are doing the same thing about your products. There is there is no difference. And I think that really, for me, sums up brand is it, you, if you start viewing it that way as a personality rather than just a thing, then you'll start to grasp how you can actually create a brand that connects with your customers in the way that you want to. And, and what are some of the ways you've seen um, different brands change the way that they've marketed uh, their products this year? I mean, for me, I've been working with some, some of the bigger tech companies, the likes of a Dell and a Microsoft and a Google, and they've all had these huge, as Tara mentioned before, you know, live events was a classic, you know, marketing um, medium for people and you know a lot of these tech companies have these huge budgets for live events and all of a sudden you know companies that size they've still got those budgets and they're they're doing you know people are still buying loads of hardware buying loads of software so they've turned it into instead focusing on for example uh, digital events podcasting um what, what else have you seen or what do you think people should should maybe be looking at yeah, I think for me, influencer marketing has been a real, real key thing. You know, we've we've launched quite a few influencer marketing campaigns in, in the last couple of weeks. So I think, you know, really it's looking at creative ways because as a brand, you know, coming back to that personality piece, influencers are a perfect example of that. They're a brand, but they're also a person. And mm. so they know their audience and they align to their audience. Their audience trust them. They've got rapport. And there's a, a sort of to and from relationship between them. So I think that influencer marketing, I have seen, you know, massively increase over COVID. There's been some flack for it. And yeah. I think the, the biggest challenge at the moment with digital marketing and with digital online events is there's so many people doing it is how do you stand out in the crowd? And I think the one thing that people have missed this year is not enough people have backed it up with physicality. And by that, I mean, you know, you can send all the emails and social media messages and videos that you want, but unless you're also reaching out on a physical level, because we are sensory creatures. I mean, I feel I feel bad sitting here drinking, you know, Claire's fabulous drink, but this is an example of a product that, you know, you could explain to me all day long what it is and, and you know, how, how it relates to me as a person. But until I taste it, yeah. or even, you know, if I was to get, a, you know, a macaroon through the post with the same flavoring in, a single one in a box, mm. you know, these are, are actually relatively easy things that people can do to turn a brand into a physical object that just makes a connection. Because I think one thing that we do all forget is that digital often you know, when you look at consumer psychology research, it's often is perceived as as less connecting. And especially these days, we get bombarded with things all day, every day. So I think people just need to think a bit more about what can I do that's still physical? I can do all this great digital stuff and it's very much part of my strategy, but how do I make sure that I'm also being physical and I'm connecting with people on that sort of deep emotional level? Mm. Yeah, I chatted to one of the webinars earlier this week, Brendan Kane, um, who was in LA, and he 
uh, built the social platforms for the likes of um, Taylor Swift um, and Rihanna. Um, then he decided, off, you know, off the back of that, to build his own following, uh, which is like a, a million and a half, I think. And then he wrote a book, How to Get a Million Followers in Thirty Days, which again is just one of those hooks that is going to sell a load of books, no matter what the content inside the books. But he can obviously back it up, given um, what he's done in that space. Um, Tara, how much you? you, you mentioned it briefly before maybe we could dive into that a little bit more um with yourself um so when you identify the marketing strategy for for launching beauty effect um and i would assume rightly or wrongly that again influencer marketing would, would play a pretty uh, important role um how early on did you identify that and and did you come up with a strategy for that initially and how have you had to change that kind of tailor that well, I was looking at the fact that that was always my strategy from the beginning. So I didn't have to adapt too much um, because of COVID in that sense. Um, everything we've done up to date has been fully organic. And I believe in that because I myself do not believe in influencers when they're telling me every day to buy a new product. And, and just because they've been gifted something, it doesn't mean it's a great product to buy. So I think now audiences see fully through that. So it has to be more authentic. And for me, someone who, as an influencer, is going to represent beauty effect has to be aligned with the same messaging. And although we're doing that fully organically, um, it is tough to make sure because we're reaching out to a lot of different influencers all the time. And I personally try to speak to them before. As well. So I know that they're aligned, they fully understand my product uh, because I've spent years making this product. But if they just, you know, they show it in a different way, it's not going to get across to the actual audience. And also I feel from the audience point of view, they want to follow influencers who they believe in what they're actually saying. So when they have that, and, and that comes from just authenticity, just making sure that actually that person understands your product, they would actually use it themselves. And then whoever they're telling is going to believe it as well. Yeah. Um, and I, have you got your product there? I have, yes, I have it here. I was say, given the um, touching, feeling, that kind of thing. I don't know if you can see it from Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we can. Away a bit, but there it is. So basically, it's... it's ah, sort of, okay. What we actually spent two years of the three and a half years doing was refining the lighting system. So this truly simulates daylight perfectly. So you can actually see how you look to others before you leave the front door. Uh, but not just daylight, also a total of five lighting environments. So you can adjust your makeup and perfect it for where you're going. Because before, women would always do your makeup in the same light at home, and then you'd go out and it'd be in the evening, and the light looks very different. So so, so, so does your face and your makeup. So mm -hmm. you adjust it to that lighting, and you can go through different scenarios. So that's candlelight. I don't know if it comes across on the camera there at all, but it, I got yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can see it's changing, and it goes yeah. from the candlelight all the way to the it was bright sun at the end there. So it varies. Lighting is so key to getting the perfect flawless finish. Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing the makeup in the wrong light, then uh, you, you are going to have makeup mishaps. And that's the first step of getting no makeup mishaps is using the correct lighting. But the real beauty of this and the reason why I was looking for this product was not just the lighting aspect. It was also the fact that normally you have to have, you have to be confined to a dressing table. With this, you have everything you need. If I try to lift it up, um, everything you need right where you need it. So you're no, no longer having to stand in a bathroom or sit at a dressing table. You can have your dressing table anywhere you want in your home or outside. So mm. I, I've got it on my desk today. I was doing my emails before this call, because we did my makeup. It was just no trouble, it's effortless. Um, everything's right where you need it, so you can find it quickly, use it, put it back. There's no rummaging through messy makeup bags. Um, so you save a lot of time, valuable time that's normally wasted every single day going through five eyeliners that you don't need, trying to find the one that you do. With, with, with it laid out this way, you can find it so easily. Um, and and just the beauty of every aspect, I mean, just the mirror, you can tilt to any position and it holds. Mm -hmm. Similar to what you find on a on a laptop, never before on a, on a beauty device or a mirror. This is, that means you can put it on your lap, you can sit on a bed, but it doesn't matter. And, and lighting, I've, I've noticed, you know, having done, I think I've done over 300 live webinars since March now, um, is absolutely key. And I think it, it, you, you see now like the conversations I've had with like a lot of the tech companies, I think it was just with Dell last week, they're like, you know, we can't talk about this right now, but we're bringing out this, this product by the end of the year, which we hope to be able to talk about very soon um, because of the quality 
um, of the lighting is is so key. Um, what what are your thoughts on that, Louis? Looking at that and thinking of it like visually and yeah, I, I mean, I think as as you say that it for for me it's more about the feeling, right? And I think that obviously you know, women connect actually more emotionally to their products than men do. You know, we, we tend to be a little bit more in the kind of logical side of the equation, although not always. I think yeah. most men would think that they'd make all logical decisions. We definitely don't. But yeah, I think that, it, you know, lighting, um, music, you know, all of these things that they change an emotional state. So I think that's, that's amazing, Tara. You know, it's, it's creating the environment in which somebody's getting ready into and, and that's sort of allowing them to yeah. put themselves in that environment that they're going to be in later. Um, and I think that's it, you know, that, that's sort of sometimes the secret behind really good branding and marketing is just that is, as soon as somebody starts to imagine and feel, you know, I, I explain a lot of the time when using sensory marketing, you know, smells. Um, if we think about when our partner, girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife puts on a really nice cologne perfume or aftershave, there's that brief moment when they walk past you, you go, oh, you, you smell nice. And that tiny, tiny little exchange has actually changed your emotional state. So it, it doesn't take a lot. And I think that's the thing, whether whether it's lighting, whether it's sound, whether it's a smell, whether it's a taste, it's a, it's a, actually a very brief moment in time, but instills in somebody that subconscious feeling that they remember you know, um, in that sort of uh, sort of psychology world, we call it involuntary memory. Is somebody later on remembers a smell or a sensation or a sound, and it takes them back to a moment where they were. So I'm sure you're going to get a lot of people um, feel that way, Tara, about the product. They'll remember when they first used it and when, oh, this is why I like this product. It allows me to put myself in that position that mm -hmm. I'm going to be in sort of later and imagine it. Yeah. I, I really like that. It's exactly what you said, that you're creating that moment of somebody getting ready and they could be creating that moment wherever they decide to take that product. Mm -hmm. I think that that's that's like the key key marketing message, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, for your product, clearly it's a great time of year coming up. I can already see somebody here saying, I, Tara, I need one for my daughter. Can I have a link, please? <laughs> Somebody's posted up the link and then someone else has said, um, any promo codes, Tara? So I don't know if you've already got stuff like that on your on your Instagram. People can go, what is the Instagram? Is it just Beauty Effect? For Beauty Effect, yeah. yeah. Beauty okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing. You're exactly right, Louis. I mean, um, the feeling you get with this is you don't feel stressed anymore. Normally, day to day, you're feeling stressed, trying to find the item you need. You're in a hurry. It's always it's so slow. When you're looking for something, you can't find it. And we've all been there where we're just rushing around every morning. We're trying to do a million things. The last thing we're going to be doing is being stressed about trying to look good as well. So with this, it's now effortless. So for me, I sit with my kids while they're having breakfast at the kitchen table, making sure they've done their homework, and I'll just do my makeup. And it's so intuitive finding everything that you can do it in autopilot. You're not even thinking about it. You see everything clearly. You just, it just, it's just so, so easy that it becomes... Um, something that is no longer a chore, whereas before you always think, oh, I've got to still do my makeup, I've, you know, whether you're sitting at a dressing table or standing in a bathroom, it's so inconvenient. But it's just the way that we've always done it. It's just, that is, everyone's just thought that is the normal way to do things. We have to go and leave our friends and family and go and sit in a separate room from them for 20 minutes, 30 minutes at a time to do our makeup in an inefficient way where we're rummaging through, trying to find items, unpacking them, and then packing them all the way again. So for me, it's just trying to almost educate people that there is such a better way of doing things where everything's laid out right where you need it, you've got the perfect lighting, you don't need a big dressing table taking up all that space in your home, you can just, this is, this is literally everything you need and the best of it as well. There is no better way to lay your makeup out than this. There is no better makeup light on the market than this. And the mirror as well, distortion-free glass mirror that you can tilt to any angle to suit you so you're not adjusting to it. It's literally giving you the best of everything. So you have that feeling like you said, Louis, you can, you know, you, you know, when you think about doing your makeup, you feel happy, you don't feel worried and stressed about time, you fit it around your schedule. And do you, if, if, do you look at other avenues? So for me, having come from the airline industry, um, six, 16, 17 years there, I'm already thinking when, when travel opens up again. Yeah, I mean, for travel, it's a no brainer, because yeah. even if you have the perfect setup at home, you're not going to have that when you're traveling. So um, 
at home, you know, you can use it. And when you're ready to go, you just literally put the whole thing in your suitcase and you're good to go. Yeah. No, you don't have the right lighting or dressing table or anything in a hotel anyway. So there is no better way to do your makeup when you're away. But at home, equally, every single day is really the beauty of it. It just revolutionizes your whole routine, making it easier, saving you time and giving you a better result. And, and when you originally thought about um, the product and you said you, you came about because you uh, you literally couldn't find it so you were trying to solve a, a problem for yourself yeah. did that make it make it easier because yeah. you were making the product and then marketing it to you and and people like you did that yeah. make it easier to think about that the marketing strategy and all of that yeah, I think so because really I was my customer I, I made this and designed it for myself but I think as any new business just because there's, something's not out there it doesn't necessarily mean you need to create it because it may yeah. be it's not out there with this I was quite sure there was definitely a need for it because so many people would go through the same thing and I, I still see it every day where even if it's your TV on you see very like successful women like just doing their makeup with a mirror near a window with a makeup spread all over the floor getting their carpet dirty and, and I've had previous homes as well and it just is strange to me that in this day and age where you know there's so much innovation and everything is available on demand why isn't your makeup and why can't you just do it where you want to do it in your home? Why do you have to be confined to one place? So I think that was really the, the kind of moment I had, which I just knew that this product had to be out there and I had to be the one to create it. Yeah. Um, Louis, when people um, thinking about sometimes it's not as easy as, as that, given that they're, they're not marketing it to themselves. Um, what are some of the things that, that, you would advise that people could think about when they're trying to think of who their ideal customer is and how they can find that ideal customer yeah so I'm absolutely right i mean i think that when you're trying to talk to your to your clients to your prospective um audience one of the biggest problems is that sometimes we put too much emphasis on ourselves and not enough the audience and so it's you know i think uh, it's really important to when it's not so easy and when it's not so clear cut as that you know, people approach me a lot with, you know, what seems like really good ideas that they've come up with in their bedroom and sat with for, you know, six months and decided that it's the next greatest, best, brilliant thing. But until you actually start getting out and just talking to people, and that could start with family and friends, they're always going to be slightly biased. And then it's just about getting out and, and um, you know, getting out to a wider audience. I think this is one of the great things that I've seen startups, you know, do through social media. You know, if, if we look at crowdfunding as an example, what an amazing platform, you know, yes, they have to build a following. Yes, you still need a bit of budget to get it out there. But it's an amazing way to get a load of people to basically tell you whether they would or would not buy your product. So I think that even now in the digital era, it's so much easier to test a product. You know, even if you just conceptualize it, it's digital, you make a video about it, you haven't even got one. You know, you sort of cobble one together out of bits of cardboard and, you know, from one camera angle, it looks like the real thing. And I think it's just a case of putting it out there into the world and, and see what comes of it. I think obviously now, it's difficult. Hopefully when COVID lifts, we can go and meet real human beings again. And so I think it's it's really important to have that process of going out there and talking to people. You know, it was really nice that the last festival of enterprise I went to, I actually had a couple of people come up to me after the talk and show me their products before mm. they were even, you know, completed. And I think not enough people do that. Not enough people... Yeah are going to events and talking to people and getting that out there because once you start to get a little bit of initial data and you're sort of saying right i've talked to enough people i'm getting some response on social media it i'm i'm actually able to test the product i think that's one thing that um you know coming from kind of pre-digital world you know when i started my business it was much much harder to do that you know we didn't have social media in the same way so i think people just need to leverage that a bit more and um and not be scared as well of future marketing that's something i talk to clients a lot about is not just talking about what is now but what is to come what might be what the product could be and so i think that's a really good place to get some response as well if you start putting those thoughts out there and being honest and authentic you know like tara said it's it's, it's about being authentic with your own audience and saying hey look i've got this this dream this idea the product's here right now it, it might not be finished but what do you all think and start to ask and talk to that audience and, and get some response Wise words, thank you. Um, and I'm interested to know, Tara, when you 
we're thinking of ideal customers, um, ideal customer avatar for you. Um, did you identify a couple of different potential ideal customers? And um, what I'm thinking of here is I, I interviewed Danny Gray from Warpaint for Men a couple of times now. And I, I think even your husband might have been on the panel at Dragon's Den. Well, yeah. I thought so, yeah. And um, and they've just, it's Warpaint for Men is literally taken off. You know, like yeah. Makeup for Men has literally absolutely taken off. He said he, said he literally, you know, and I spoke to him during lockdown. And he said the, the market in the Far East, like Japan, China, et cetera, was unbelievable. They couldn't keep up with demand. They couldn't get the stock to get it out. And I'm just thinking, you know, f for you, have you, have you looked at that side of things? Is, is that like phase two, phase three? In terms of internationally? Yeah, in terms of different, yeah, different audiences that you think this product would suit, for example. I think, um, starting out, I mean, for me, really, you know, it's clear that anyone who uses makeup or not even just for makeup, even for skincare. I, I have one yeah. I use just for my skincare in the evening. It's just so handy for all these things that it's really for everyone. But of course, you can't market to everybody unless you have a crazy, you know, billion pound budget. So, yeah. um, so really, have to you have to select a group. And I, and I think it it was a case where we had to really think, you know, who is going to be buying this product. And what we've seen actually is is very different to what we thought. So it's been it's been actually spread across the board. So we've had younger um, women buying it, we've had older women buying it, we've had in the middle, we've had a lot of men purchasing it as gifts. Um, of course. Right from yeah. um, which I think, uh, although we weren't actually targeting and trying to reach out to men, I think uh, it got on their radar. Mm. And, um, and yeah, huge, I think it was about 30% of our sales were, was to men. Was it? Yeah. So those were the decision makers. Yeah. Like, yeah, interesting. Either that or it was women uh, buying, using the men's credit cards <laughs> <laughs> i love that that's a social post just there you need a meme for that or something <laughs> but no, no it's been interesting so i think it's clear that you might have something in your mind but don't be so focused on just what you think um you know you have to be quite adaptable and and that's what the beauty of like you said louis in this day and age now there is actually no better time to be launching a business because normally you wouldn't have that data just readily to hand Every day, I can see where my traffic's coming from, who's driving it. I know where to start focusing. More, more ads, you know, everything is just so easy in that sense. But at the same time, you're competing against people where it's also as easy. Yeah. What What are your thoughts, Louis? What would, from what I just said with uh, and, and Tara's inf data there that we've got that thirty percent uh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Sure. I mean, I think. This is one thing I say, especially internationally, you never know where that market or niche might be. And and I, I had it, um, you know, we were selling chocolates internationally. I got invited to go to a show in Mexico and, and they, you know, I got a distributor that got in touch. And for a year, I just kept putting it off because I was saying, but, but chocolate comes from Mexico. We can't possibly sell British chocolate back to Mexicans. It's it's just not a thing. Um, and it and it it became our most successful launch ever. Um, and we were the sort of best selling sort of foreign chocolate brand in in Mexico for a long time. So you you never know where that niche is going to be, and you never learn until you start putting it out there into the world. And I think one of the useful things is to as you start to get some early data and and you you might not you know it might be earlier than that but to create you know in the marketing world we call it personas so you actually sit down and map out different people and like i said you know thinking about it from a personality and a human point of view give them a name give them an age give them a job title you know where do they bank where do they shop so you're trying to formulate you know what what does our customer look like and where can we go and find them and so you will have different personas that do and have different consumer um behaviors so uh, as sara said when you start to build up that data you can start to create more and more personas figure out you know okay where are we getting some sales where do we think an opportunity might be to open up a new persona and therefore, you can then start to shape your marketing around that. So, well, actually, maybe maybe next year, you know, we need to target men in January because Valentine's is coming up. So mm -hmm. that that sort of thinking allows you to then build marketing structures around each individual persona. And so it, it, you're, you're broader, but you're still targeted to that specific persona. And you know that certain marketing that you're doing is, is sort of perfectly targeted to those people. So, as I said, sketch them out, draw them 
put a face on them, get some stock images, really start to to bring some humanity to to what you're doing and the personas, and and then look at ways that you can interact with them where they are and um, where they like to be talked to. Yeah, great great advice. Um, uh, lots of nice comments coming through. We have got questions as well, which I will get to before we uh, we sign off. So thank you all um, very much indeed for the questions and comments that are coming in. Um, Tara, how challenging or not challenging maybe was it when you were thinking of pricing a brand new product um, and how different was your thinking to maybe say two, three years ago when you first came up with the idea compared to now actually launching it into into the world in 2020? It's an interesting question because pricing, I think, for any new brand is, is a, obviously difficult and it is a challenge to figure out, you know, how much would someone be prepared to pay for your product when you don't, you know, that product doesn't exist. It's a new product. Um, I think when I started, um, I literally had no idea. I didn't know how much it was going to cost me in terms of investment to get this product made as well. It's all been a learning process as, as you go. Um, I think going back to then, if I if I'd known actually at that time how long it would take me to do this, I probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> a little bit naive because I had the idea around Christmas and, and literally I thought, you know, in my mind, you know, summer is going to be in the shops. You know, literally at that point, I came from being a dental surgeon. So my 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 expertise was not in business. So yeah. I'm actually glad though for that because had I known I had two small babies at the time, I probably wouldn't have gone down this path. Yeah. But I feel that I did because it's been so rewarding and especially now having the product out there and seeing the real need for it. Uh, but coming back to the price, I think um, it really, I mean, you don't really know exactly. I mean, I didn't just pull a figure out from thin air. It's come from based on my margins. Um, the product what I was trying to bring to the market wasn't the plan. The, Beauty Effect plan is not to be the cheapest product on the market, it's to be the best. Mm. And the best, there is a premium price always. But I didn't want to be, become a price which is not affordable by a lot of people as well, because then there's no point having a great product, but no one can afford to buy it and use it. So and that's that was the whole thinking behind the price. And um, the, pro the product really, I mean, it, serves, it solves a big purpose. I mean, it replaces a need for a dressing table, a mirror, a light, and all your makeup storage. So if you think about it, all of that would normally cost you well over the price of the Beauty Effect box. And not just that, you're actually getting the best makeup light on the, on the market, the best mirror that you can angle to any position, the best way that your makeup is actually laid out. So I think, you know, if you, it's really value, it's a, it's a luxury quality item that you're buying, a premium item, but mm -hmm. it, you're getting a lot of value for it. Yeah, and what, what are your thoughts, Lou, for those, as, as Tara, encapsulated there um, perfectly when you are launching a brand new product or service it's so difficult and, I, and I've seen so many people you know make the mistake of just looking at who they think their competition is and going you know five pound higher five pound lower and trying to kind of sit in there um, what was your advice with people that you work with when they were looking at that mate yeah, so price is always a difficult thing. And I think the first thing you have to decide is whether you're talking about a company or a brand. Um, you know, a lot of people end up being companies and, and not brands. So, you know, if, if we look at Apple as an example, I'm a massive Apple fan, lots of us out there. If you actually look at the Apple components inside, you take them apart, you strip it down. They're not actually that high quality. But yet, Apple do cost more than anything else, and it's because it makes us feel a certain way when we use it. So again, it's coming back to that emotional piece. Um, their marketing makes us feel a certain way. There's a sort of club attitude to the to the users. So I think the first thing you have to decide is: is this a transactional business? You know, am I just trying to create a product and and get a sale? And, and that's it? Or am I trying to build something for the future? Am I trying to build a brand? I think that's when it diverts. If it's just a transaction, then you're going to be a lot more led by the market. You're going to be a lot more led by your competitors. And then it's it's really down to your individual margin strategies, where you're selling. Because obviously, if you're selling you know, through, through e-commerce versus a retailer, it's all different. But I think brands is really when it gets interesting, because how can you put a price on a feeling? And I think that's if you set out like Tara has to create something of value, of worth, it's going to make people feel a certain way, then you've got a lot more flexibility in your pricing. And then the market will always tell you to some extent whether it will sell or not. You know, we had it many, many times. We launched products that I loved or, you know, the team that I'd got loved and, and we really wanted them to be successful. And some of them did, some of them didn't, you know, and, and again, um, international 
business really sheds some interesting lights on that as well. You know, is we couldn't sell a chocolate bar here in the UK that would actually sell at any sort of decent levels for more than about three quid a piece. It just it didn't work. We could maybe sell a few in sort of Selfridges and Fortnum and Mason, but really the the quantities were so low. Mm. Our chocolate bars, a lot of the more premium ones, we were selling for sort of six and eight quid in Mexico, and we were selling 20, 30 times the volume we ever would in the UK. So Mm. sometimes that's it. You don't know until you go out to a marketplace. But I think just always come back to brand. Always come back to selling what it is, how it makes people feel, the value of it. The um, you know, and and I think a key thing here as well that I will say that will always always allow you to charge more is appreciation, empathy, and compassion within your company, and that has to be genuine. But you know, I say a lot to audiences of sort of CEOs and managing directors. I stand up in front of, and I always ask the same question. Um, and I say, right, think of the last. 10, 15 orders you got, not the biggest, not the smallest. What gifts did you send those people to say thank you for choosing you? Mm. A lot of the time I get a blank stare. Occasionally somebody will say, oh, well, well, actually, we, you know, we sent some Christmas cards. But I think that appreciation is something that is very undervalued in sort of overall strategy and showing appreciation to your customers and clients because they have chosen you. You know, Tara obviously has a unique product in the marketplace, um, but for many other businesses, people are choosing you over a competitor. They could go somewhere else. So always remember that. Always remember that, you know, you should be showing appreciation. If you do that, you'd be surprised. We had so many customers, um, you know, we used to send birthday cards, Christmas cards, presents for their kids, wives, dogs. And um, we had a lot of our competitors knock their doors and they'd phone us up proudly and go, oh, you'll never guess who turned up at our door. We said no, because we love you guys. Mm-hmm. Um, and so probably they could have got a better price, but it, it was that brand that they were interacting with. So I, I think that's that's a, a big piece on pricing strategy is appreciate the business that you've got, show appreciation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with a bit of service, you're actually able to charge more. Uh, yeah, I was re- reading a book last night, um, Chris uh, Gillibo, who wrote like the hundred dollar startup and has got a great podcast, etc. And uh, he was saying, you know, if if you're literally, you know, brand new, launching a brand new product, you know, if you don't have hundreds and thousands of orders coming in from day one, send them a personal email, send a card, like you say, or something to to that address. You know, that personal touch, and you 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 don't know what the repeat business is going to be. What is the uh, long-term customer value going to be of that customer by getting that kind of a service that absolutely blow them away yeah completely and and that's it you i think that's a sort of humility point as well alex you don't know who anyone is you know you don't know who anyone's partners right. girlfriends uncles cousins and and you know we do live in a world that you know knowing a lot and having knowledge is is a great thing but uh, you know, it's been my experience a lot of time in business. It is kind of who you know, you know, and having those connections has to come from a place of sort of genuine appreciation and humility of you don't know who this person is. I mean, you know, I won't bore anyone with another story, but the reason I went to Mexico is because I spilt hummus down a guy's suit at an event who turned out to be the president of ING Bank, but he didn't give me his real business card for about an hour. It was only after I sort of talked to him and we had a really nice conversation. Um, and he, one of his contacts ended up booking me to go to a show in Mexico which turned out to be our biggest market so mm. I think that's it you've just got to really have that humility to say uh, you know I- I'm going to treat everyone um, with appreciation and sort of loyalty and as you say if you're first starting out you absolutely have to do handwritten notes and pictures and you know spray the cards with your perfume or the scent of your company or send a, a little box of chocolates or macaroons or something just to say thank you it's in the grand scheme of things you know we've all got margin in our products for marketing and for me that's that's part of it is put some budget in your product just to, to do that to stop and say, well, what am I going to do and change it around? You know, what am I going to send them this week? What am I going to send them next month? Just to, to say thank you. It goes goes a long way. Yeah, I like it a lot. Um, time for a couple of questions before we finish up. Um, here we go. So Tara, how did you get over the fear, anxiety of initially initially putting your work out to the public? That's a really good question. Um, well, initially, I mean, going back, I always used to be very scared of something I didn't fully know. Coming from being a dental surgeon, it's not something you can learn on the job. You have to be trained. So because of that, I've always shied away from things that I wasn't trained in. So just getting over that initial fear, just to go for it and have that 
have that kind of faith in myself that I can achieve this. And my desire really to do it was to inspire my children to look up and say, you know, well, their dad obviously is super successful, but their mum can also be as well. And that's really the driving force as well behind this. But I wasn't, I mean, that night before we launched, I couldn't sleep. Um, you know, I was so nervous because it, it's like my baby. I've literally been working on something three and a half years. Yeah. No one really knows what it is. I've kept it super secret and quiet and I'm about to release it to everyone to see. So, it, you know, there's no way you can get really over that. You have to just embrace it. And it's part of that feeling that you'll, I'll always remember, I'll never forget that feeling of that night before and at midnight when our website went live and it was, other people could see it. It was crazy. And it was strange that people started actually coming on the site at midnight. And I was like, how do they even know about it? <laughs> so <laughs> they put one post on my social media. So it's actually an incredible feeling. And I think you have to just embrace that fear and go for it. And how have you felt about putting yourself um, physically in the public eye with regards to, say, taking photos, videos? Um, have you embraced doing that, you know, on the fly as well? You know, so many people these days want, instead of it being, um, you know, and we can't at the moment. That's the great thing mm -hmm. I was trying to say. The great leveler has been the technology, of course. You can't just call a camera crew to come around at the drop of a hat. You, you know, literally got your iPhone. Yeah. Have you embraced that? Well, that, that's the thing. I mean, previously I wasn't really out there too much on social media, so mm -hmm. I cringe every time when I see myself doing a video. I literally, uh, I was looking at some yesterday and they were like, we need to put these out. And even when I do for you guys, I was just cringing at it. And I think you know, <laughs> yeah. I tend to get used to that. But um, again, you, you have to get out there. I think it's so important. I mean, this brand it, it is a reflection of myself. I mean, I put everything into it. It has been my baby from the start. and and what I'm trying to put out there is a brand at the end of the day, like you said, Louis, this is, it's so important to be authentic. And I genuinely want the best for this. It's not about just, if I was just trying to look for a business and just, I would have launched this, you know, a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. but it was fully ready. I put that extra time and that money into this product to make it what it is, because I truly believe in the product and the brand and the brand ultimately will be um, the go-to brand for all beauty tools and devices. That, that's what I want to achieve. And I have lots of ideas of amazing other products, which I'll also add to it as time goes by and we grow it. Um, so I'm really excited to have that platform to be able to bring products out there, which I know will genuinely help the person who's using them. It's giving them that best product and that customer service, like you said, it's so, so key. Because I know personally for myself, if I deal with a company and you can't get a hold of them and, and they give you a poor service, you just straight away, I'm just like, forget that, you know, yeah. to be involved. And I think it's so important now more than ever when there is some of these services out there that you have to give that right quality of service to what someone deserves to have. So um, that's always been important from day one for me. Uh, anything to, to add to that, Louis, for those who are, you know, in those initial phases might, like Tara, have been thinking about this idea for the, for the last couple of years and are still sitting on the fence, still procrastinating, you know, what's going to get them to go over the other edge and, you know, essentially screw it, just do it, launch a business. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, you know, we we all have things that, you know, we, we need to work through. And I think one of the things that people make a disconnect of is that our mental health in our personal lives and our psychology is actually with us in our business lives. So I think the, the first thing I'd say that's really important, and, and it's nice that there's more of a platform and people talking about it now, is actually bringing up psychology and self-awareness and emotional intelligence and talking about it in a business context. And I think that if that if you are really struggling because you're you're worried about what people are going to think or you're anxious about doing something or being on camera, whatever it is, to me, that's not a business issue. That's actually a, that's sort of a personal psychological thing. So I think that one of the best things that people can do is help themselves get better acquainted with their own mental health because we all have mental health. We don't just have it when it goes wrong. We all have it at all times. So it's actually having an understanding and self-awareness. So read some psychology books. Um I mean, Gabor Mate is a guy that I would recommend absolutely everybody in business or not to read. But, you know, is reading some books and sort of understanding, well, where do these things come from? Where do these feelings come from? Well, it's it's 
family, friends. It's because you were bullied when you were 12. It's because who knows, you know, each person has their own story. So I think sometimes start there, start with that psychology and, and self-awareness and understand that we all have those feelings. We all struggle. Everybody that you've ever seen on TV or a radio station at some point was absolutely bricking it, you know, before their first interview, before that first camera was shoved in their face. Um, so, I think it's just remembering that we're all human and we all have, you know, our quirks. So and understand that first. But ultimately, I think you just have to ask yourself a question. You know, do I want the life that I have now or do I want something to change? Because if yeah. I want something to change, then something has to change. You know, mm. I, I can't do the same thing and expect the different results. So I think it's you've just got to get to that point and say, well, Am I going to do something? And what? when am I going to make that decision? As I said, the self-awareness and emotional stability will help you get there. But ultimately, you're the one who has to make that first step and just decide, OK, I'm going to make a change. And it might be painful um, and it's going to be hard and I'm going to have to be disciplined. But, you know, imagine the life that I could have when it all goes right. Yeah, no, brilliant. Brilliant words. Um, so last couple of questions. Um, Tony, um, asks how do you deal with the need to build a brand that fits the market but ultimately could cause problems later with the running of the business examples such as innocent that later sold to coca-cola um body shop selling to l'oreal i think wasn't it um yeah I, either of you will you adjust your strategy so maybe that first atara and then you can give your take on that um as well louis yeah will that will you adjust your strategy um, if you're building a brand, I'll reiterate that. How do you deal with the need to build a brand that fits the market now, but ultimately could cause problems later with the running of the business? Examples such as Innocent, Sold to Coke, Body Shop, Sold to L'Oreal. Yeah, I mean, you just don't know. I mean, it's so early. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, hopefully, you know, you have to focus on the positive. I think, um, you know, running a business, I mean, for me, I was selling for business for so many years and it went overnight, literally at midnight hit and I went from selling a business to running a business and it's two totally different things so my day-to-day -day now is around it consists of putting out fires whereas before it was, it was me being on the phone to manufacture every day so it's completely different uh, things and I think as we grow the challenges will change as well and you have to adapt to them that's a part of being an entrepreneur and uh, running a business is putting out fires being adaptable not being too stuck in what you think you have to do but actually just doing what you need to do um, and just going back to the previous question as well, um, you know, if you, something scares you and you don't challenge yourself, you're never going to grow. So personally for me, I like challenging myself so that I feel that I've actually achieved something and you've got that growth. Because that's all, that's what life is about at the end of the day. If you stay in your comfort zone, you're going to be in one spot for the whole, your whole life, which is kind of quite boring. So just go and just challenge yourself, do that, make that change. And, you know, and you, you'll surprise yourself what you can actually achieve. Yeah, no, great words. And I know these days that when, when I'm feeling those kind of butterflies in my stomach and I'm feeling scared about something, I now know it's only taken me 40 years to get here, but I now know that's a good thing. <laughs> keep keep pushing, keep going in that direction. Um, yeah, and Rowena Bird mentioned this because uh, on, on Monday talking, um, you know, Rowena, one of the co-founders of Lush, and before that they were working, you know, with um, – Anita at a Body Shop, and she was talking about that, you know, th them being so anti animal testing, and then apparently L'Oreal being uh, a brand that is synonymous with animal testing, which which I didn't know. So that was that was an interesting conversation on Monday. Um, Louis, your thoughts on that? And I've got a couple more questions to finish off. So thank you, everybody. Yeah. So I th I think that um, you know this somewhat comes down to I, I guess personal morals as well and and your your purpose for driving a business and I think that I've I've got a very different perspective I guess because I never started out to be an entrepreneur I didn't find out what the word was two years after you know till I started so I was I always say to people I was an entrepreneur by default I was trying to create a, a sort of life for myself and a, and a job and because I, I left school so early so I, I just kind of ended up falling into it falling in love with business and my product so for me it was incredibly incredibly deeply rooted to um, a purpose and that purpose actually was raising awareness and funds for conservation through the medium of selling chocolate that's that's really what my purpose was we were very early in doing it sort of you know 2005 2006 people didn't really care as much as they do now about that kind of thing um and i actually got approached by a very very large company 
who weirdly um, are one of the the largest sort of palm oil um, product producers, and we were very very anti palm oil. Mm. Um, and and I said no, and and you know if I'm being honest. If I'd have said yes, it probably would have set me up for life. But I think for me, it was just a case of I, I didn't want to do that because I didn't actually want to go against um, the choices that I'd made and, and the purpose. And so I think for me, there's, you know, there's always a case of, you know, do you sell a business? Do you not? Who do you sell to? And it's all about each individual person, you know, what they want to do and what they want out of life. Maybe somebody does just want to sell and disappear off and retire. Um, and that's amazing. But I think if you if you know what your purpose is that helps to dictate the decision because if your purpose doesn't align with that decision it's then very easy to make it you just sort of go well it, it doesn't align with me and my ethics and my greater purpose of what i'm trying to achieve in my life um and so i think yeah it make, makes those decisions a, a lot easier um Lianka said, yeah, I've been procrastinating out of fear. My mother said exactly that. And thank you, Louis. I've pulled out my old psychology books. This session has been so helpful. helpful. Absolute gold. Um, Tara, thank you. Love your products. Perfect to store my makeup on the go. Um, last couple of questions we've got. Um, how do you go about targeting your audience if your audience is a broad spectrum as an artist? Hmm. I mean, if I if I could maybe just jump in, I mean, I think that within a broad spectrum, as as we talked about before, there's still going to be personas. Um, your your product, whoever and whatever you do, will never ever apply to every single human being on earth. It's it's just not, you know, I, I can't think of anything that every single human uses apart from maybe money. But you know, the the there really isn't anything that goes across everybody. So there will be some audience segmentation in there somewhere. You know, whether it's dictated by price, whether it's dictated by the reasons that they want to buy your product. So I think start with what makes your consumers similar and then start to work out where those parameters are. It might be very broad, but you'll still find commonality. And, and this is where personas is a very important thing to do, is to start to also find other similar brands, people, artists to you, and start to match them up with with your product and, and your brand. So as just as an example, you know, we used to sell quite a lot through QVC. Um, back in the day, they didn't have the best reputation. They went through sort of a complete overhaul and a rebrand, but their whole business was predicated on their persona was exactly the same as a John Lewis customer. So, I mean, lots of people shop in John Lewis for lots of reasons, but they just knew that that was the art audience that they were targeting, you know, and, and also similarly, there's a company called Vela Boylant and exactly the same thing on their persona list were John Lewis customers. So there will be a market out there. You just have to do maybe a bit more digging and figuring out where those personas lie, and then you can go about targeting them, even if it is broad. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Just looking at more questions we've got coming in. Um, oh, this is a difficult one, I think. What would you consider a decent startup amount if you were on low income, but you didn't want to, you don't want to take out any loans? Kind of depends on the product or service, doesn't it? Again, and I think that's a tricky one. How long the piece of string made is it? Yeah, I think it is, isn't it? Um, apologies. Um, so, how should you develop? That's a good question. Okay, so maybe we'll finish up on this one because um, we have run over. I know we started late. So um, have a think about this one. So Tara, how should you target or develop your marketing strategy if your user is not your buyer, such as a children book, maybe being read by a child, but it is bought by a parent or teacher? I think that comes back to your your comment earlier about like a 30% males buying, buying the product and not even knowing that until you've launched the product to start with who your market's going to be maybe. Yeah, I mean, if you're targeting, and, and obviously with men, like men, like I, I totally didn't know, but the word obviously somehow reached men. So whether it was from their wives or partners hinting to them or sending them a screenshot, who knows? But if it's children, obviously that's difficult because children are not going to be ones shopping, especially online right now. So um, it has to be something which will relate to the parents, and the parents know their children. They know if, it, if it's a book and they want to read it to the children, they know what kind of stories their kids are going to like. So it's really reaching who is going to be buying and you need to know what's going to resonate with that person. Yeah, perfect. Um, uh, question from Burak. Again, um, I have a folding coffee table and a folding chair design. I'm sure if I can build a start, I'm sure I can build a startup around this. 
um, what do you think? I think the question is, what do you, what do you think, Burak? If you, if you think you could do it, then you can do it. What do you think, Louis? Yeah, definitely. I think I think that's what it comes down to. And I think that the greatest thing now is that if you look at so many interesting, wonderful people are making money out there on the internet, you know, look at all of the, the sort of premium subscription like YouTube and Patreon and all these different services that, you know, there are people making money doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things on the internet. So do it you know, hopefully it works. If it doesn't, you'll learn from it and create something better. But, you know, there's there's a, a market out there for almost everything now. Yeah. And and look, if, if we've helped one person through this, I'm just reading like the comments saying I've been procrastinating and, and now I've I've pulled out my old psychology books. This session has been so helpful, absolute gold. Then then we've done our job in, in inspiring um, somebody else to do the same. Um, so look, just to, just to wrap up and um, thank you for staying with us, for starting late and, and finishing a little bit late. And someone's asked, is, is Louis drinking rosé? Uh, no, we're actually drinking. I've actually got my bottle there. Um, Claire from Acorn Drinks, um, who unable, was unable to join us, but we will reschedule the session. Uh, so having a drink from their non-alcoholic aperitifs. Um, but yeah, just to finish up, Louis, people wanted to um, find out a little bit more about yourself yourself um your business consultancy services um speakers live events are clearly going to be happening again back end of spring maybe early summer we're, we're fingers crossed aren't we and um, what's the best place to go probably linkedin to be honest i mean i think you know i'm, I'm kind of on all social media I'm, I'm not massively active on on a lot of social medias i spend a lot of time on it for clients and and so it sort of lost its shine for me in some ways but yeah link, linkedin probably is the best way you sort of keep in touch drop me a message uh, and as you said alex i'm sort of gearing up for lots and lots of events next year so yeah just drop drop me a line don't be afraid i am a human being um i'm not going to bite and uh, and i will respond to you brilliant and, and tara um again where people can connect with you personally how can they find out more about your brand new beauty effect brand yeah, so beautyfect.com is the website. Um, we're on Instagram and my personal Instagram, so feel free to message me there. It's Tara underscore Lalvani. Perfect. Thank you both very, very much indeed. Um, and we've got a last session of the day coming up, um, which is being brought to you by Enterprise Nation. Uh, and my colleague Kasim is going to be hosting. Um, and that is literally going to be at 2 p.m. today. So networking is going to open up in 15 minutes. So uh, feel free to get yourself there and then join my colleague Kasim and Diane Mentor who are talking about bringing your business online. So um, just remains to me to thank all of you. Uh, I can see we've got loads of people watching, uh, which is great. Thank you very much indeed. And um, replay is going to be available over at the Festival of Enterprise YouTube channel. If you've enjoyed this and you want to send the link to somebody else to watch, then please do so. But uh, thank you, Louis. Thank you, Tara. Thank you. Um, the exit button is bottom right of the screen. It's a little door with an arrow on it that says exit. So thank you both very much indeed. And um, keep in touch. All the best thank with you. the new brand as well. I hope it goes well. I think Christmas is going to be very good to you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Tara.